Hi, Carol. Hi, Rabbi. How you doing? I don't seem to hear you. You don't hear me? Um, hmm. Okay. I'm not showing that you're muted, so I don't quite know what. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, hmm. Wait a minute. Uh, should be. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I had the wrong. Oh, okay. No, somehow my stereo switched to the wrong. My sound setup here was switched to the wrong input, which I don't know why, but oh, so be okay. it. How are you? Okay, just I'm going to go to Israel in a couple of weeks for mm -hmm. Pesach, so I'm a little, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Yeah, listen. It's, It'll be all right. One can hope so. Um, yeah. It's it's hard all to right. say. You know, now we're a little bit more concerned um, because of Israel's actions. Um, you know, the attack on. Sorry for shuffling papers here in front of you. Okay. Um, we are concerned following the attack in Syria. Um, I mean. We're not necessarily concerned about the attack on Syria, uh, but uh, the Iranians are. Uh, so um, that uh, we don't know how and if they're going to respond. And then uh, I haven't a chance to to read it yet, but uh, my colleague Danny Gordis brought to attention um, something we already know the. Uh, the consequences of the attack on the world uh, kitchen, the uh, aid workers that were yeah. killed in the Israeli attack, which Israel, of course, acknowledged. They didn't hide it. Um, uh, and they're, they're quite upset about it. But, of course, when this happens in any other conflict or with any other people, you know, it's tragic and everybody fetches and complains um, and rightfully so. This is I mean, this is a total tragedy and particularly yeah. for an aid organization that is really very good. And works with Israel is is they, they've served meal they after the attack in, on October 7th, they served meals in Israel as well. They're really good people um, from all that I could tell. And. You know, so there's no question that this is horrible. But of course, Israel is being judged in a way that no other country on the face of the planet is judged. Now, to some extent, that's not necessarily so bad because we do believe we hold ourselves to a higher standard. I don't want to be like France or Germany or God forbid, like any, of course, we're, you know, like any of the Arab countries, but it's terrible and uh there are questions like how how do we continue um this uh this war it's it's a it's a tough one it's it's horrible it's horrible for everybody so and my, and my granddaughter she's going into the army may 2nd yeah so i'm more <laughs> yeah it's, it's scary yeah when i think of my friends my friends kids and grandkids hi susie Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Hi, Susie. Hi. Hi, Hi Rabbi Popke. Hi, doing, Carol. Um, Hi. Rabbi? Yes. It's not... Hi, Ricky. time Torah Talk Hi. is not listed on any thir Thursday in the calendar. I don't really? know why. Yeah. All right, I'll double check with, um, yeah. with Stephanie. Hi, Ricky. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Susie. Hi, babe. How are you? Good, who? Good. Good morning, Carol. Good morning. <laughs> it's afternoon. It's afternoon. Yeah, it, it is afternoon now. Um, I know Shell won't be here because uh, at this time of the year, he's working with people, helping a number Absolutely. of yeah. elderly yeah. citizens with their uh, taxes. So, you know, Seikba Mitzvah, Patormi Mitzvah. Yeah. I'm gonna have to leave a little bit early because I got a, an appointment over in Rockland Mall. Okay. But I'm here now. Yeah. 
Hi, Charlotte. Good How afternoon. Are you? Bye -bye. And Mazel Tov. I'm what? Oh, the engagement. Yeah, yes. your granddaughter's engagement. <laughs> How was it? It was very nice, Susie. Yes. Um, a lot of people were there. The boys, family, his aunts, his uncles, his cousins, his friends. And we met everybody. And there were local nice. people that I knew from the past that were there, too. So um, it, was, it was very nice. Wonderful. Yeah. I like hearing happy things. Yes, a lot, a lot of good things. Engagements and babies born and all that good stuff. Yeah. She's getting married in August in Lakewood. Oh, wow. oh. So that's, it's, it's that's relatively of, soon. Yeah. Well, right after uh, Tisha Bug. <laughs> and he's going to be, wants to be a pharmacist. Wow. Good. You know, he's getting interviews for uh, whatever degree you have to get after you mm -hmm. finish college. Yeah. So it's, work, it's working. Worked out well. Okay. Um, whoops. It's Rabbi Zucker. I hope I got him in. I have all these things flashing on my uh, desk. Yes, good. Hi, Rabbi Zucker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I was afraid uh -huh. I lost you because I had all kinds of things popping up. I'm trying to distinguish between all of them. So we'll get started. We're all here. Um, we're going to take a look uh, at Parashat Shmini, which, of course, is a very dramatic parasha. We have the actual ordination of the Kohanim and the beginning of uh, the practice, the beginning of the worship at the altar. Um, we have uh, one of the two narratives in Vayikra. Uh, both of them are very sad. Uh, <laughs> and this one is a very tragic aftermath of the uh, ordination of the Kohanim, where Nadav and Avihu offer the strange fire and they are consumed and killed. Um, and then... Uh, the concluding parts of the parasha detail the laws of what will become known as kashrut, the dietary laws. So we're going to take a much more a look at those. But overall, um, emphasizing uh, this week uh, the language of Vayikra. I mean, we're now into the third parasha of Vayikra, and people always have uh, difficulties uh, with this book. Um, but you know, and especially now we're beginning with the end of this parasha and the uh, list of the dietary uh, rules. We have, we're entering into a whole uh, series of chapters on laws of ritual purity and impurity, what we know as tame and tahor. Um, and that really gets down into the, uh, the basis of life, literally. Um, and uh, not always the most pleasant, <laughs> but very important. And one thing to keep in mind when we're reading Vayikra is that this is the center of the Torah. We have two books on either side. We have a Bereshit and Shemot on one side, and we have the Midbar and Devarim on the other. And right smack dab in the middle is Vayikra. Uh, and... I, at a certain point, I, I realized that this kind of reflects a uh, what exists in the physical world in that the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the Mishkan is at the center of the camp. Mm -hmm. um, and here we have what goes on in the Mishkan at the center of the uh, Torah. Although, frankly, this idea, I, I, kind of, I think I mentioned it uh, a couple of weeks ago, is brought much more to the fore by Mary Douglas. In, uh, and, and others in taking a look at the literary structure of Vaikra. But, okay, let's just very quickly, I want to spend a lot of time on this, um, but I, I just think it's worthwhile reading um, the opening uh, preparation, you know, the consecration ceremony. So who would lie? I'm assuming everyone can read Shmini here. Uh, I'll read. Yes. Okay, thank you. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. 
He said to Aaron, take a calf of the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering without blemish and bring them before the Lord. By the way, um, very often um, we use the term purification offering uh, rather than sin offering. Um, and we've talked about that in the past, but let's anyway, let, let's, I'm not worried about the details of the sacrifices. So let's go on. Not that it isn't important. I'm just. <laughs> and speak to the Israelites saying, take a he goat for a sin offering, a calf and a lamb, yearlings without blemish for a burnt offering and an ox and a ram for an offering of well-being to sacrifice before the Lord and a meal offering with oil mixed in. For today, the Lord will appear to you. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we've, we were just reading in the past few chapters about the different sacrifices. Go ahead. So it's both the Kohanim have to bring uh, korbanot and offerings, and so too do the uh, Israelites themselves. Go ahead. They brought to the front of the tent of meeting the things that Moses had commanded. And the whole community came forward and stood before the Lord. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded that you do, that the presence of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, Come forward to the altar and sacrifice your sin offering and your burnt offering, making expiation for yourself and for the people, and sacrifice the people's offering and make expiation for them as the Lord has commanded. Aaron came I'm, forward. Whoops, sorry. Uh, sorry. What uh, happened? Oh, there it is. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's Aaron came forward. Wait, 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 wait a second. Here. Went too far. <laughs> um, sorry, I don't know what happened. I don't know what I hit. I don't get this. Um, Okay, let's try this again. Not from the first we up to? No, here. Yeah, the first eight. Aaron, Aaron came forward to the altar. Aaron came forward to the altar and slaughtered his calf of sin offering. Aaron's sons brought the blood to him. He dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar. And he poured out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. The fat. The, oh, sorry. Ugh. Keep going. Sorry. Where am I? Um, you are verse two minutes ago. You were verse mine, so you have to be in verse that. Uh, uh, sorry, I just uh, they changed the um. There you go. Yeah, there we go. The fat. Okay. The key, yeah. The fat, the kidneys, and the protuberance of the liver from, from the sin offering, he turned into smoke on the altar. As the Lord had commanded Moses, and the flesh and the... Uh, I, I'm me. sorry, I'm having trouble here with the... Um... And the flesh and the skin were consumed or at the top of the page. I apologize. As the Lord had commanded to Moses, and the flesh and skin were consumed in fire outside the camp. Then he slaughtered the burnt offering. Aaron's sons passed the blood to him, and he dashed against the sides of the altar. They passed the burnt offering to him in sections, as well as the head, and he turned it into smoke on the altar. He washed the entrails and the legs and turned them into smoke on the altar with the burnt offering. Okay, so some of the things we've seen before, blood is not consumed. Blood has to be returned, as it were, to God, because it's an acknowledgement we're taking the life of the animal. Blood symbolizes life. 
Um, it's also used um, because it symbolizes life. It is used as kind, it can be used as a detergent, as it were, to cleanse something that has become ritually impure. Uh, and uh, it's also used as kind of a prophylactic, a protection against uh, contamination. And again, blood symbolizes life. Um, one of the major sources of Tum'ah, virtual impurity, is, of course, death. Uh, we're coming up to Pesach, the blood on the lintels of the door and on the doorposts. Um, that serves as a protection uh, against uh, for the Israelites against the angel of death. So, uh, you know, we've seen we've seen this uh, this use of blood before, and as we've been reading about the sacrifices, all the details, the specific order in which things are offered, how they're the order in which they're placed on the altar, and of course, if it's a burnt offering, it's completely consumed on the altar. Go ahead. Next, he brought forward the people's offering. He took the gold for the people's sin offering and slaughtered it and presented it as a sin offering like the previous one. He brought forward the burnt offering and sacrificed it according to regulation. He then brought forward the meal offering and taking a handful of it, he turned it into smoke on the altar in addition to the burnt offering of the morning. He slaughtered the ox and the ram, the people's sacrifice of well-being. Aaron's sons passed the blood to him, which he dashed against every side of the altar, and the fat parts of the ox and the ram, the broad tail, the covering fat, the kidneys, and the protuberances of the livers. They laid these fat parts over the breast, mm -hmm. And Aaron turned the fat parts into smoke on the altar and elevated the breasts and the right thighs as an elevation offering before the Lord, mm -hmm. as Moses had commanded. A little bit more. Aaron lifted his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he ste stepped down after the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the offering of well-being. Moses and Aaron then went inside the tent of meeting. When they came out, they blessed the people, and the presence of the Lord appeared to all the people. Fire came forth from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat parts on the altar, and all the people saw and shouted and fell on their faces. Yeah, very powerful line. But Taitse Esh Milifne Adonai, fire came from before God and consumed what was on the altar. Of course, that line is going to be used later on when talking about how the fire came forth and burned Nadav and Avihu. Um, but any initial impressions of this chapter? It's Anything difficult. you noticed? Detail. Well, I mean, okay. there's such detail. Uh-huh. God expected anybody to know what to do. And <laughs> if they made the least little mistake, I mean, they were going to be punished for it. And the whole thing is pretty disgusting. And, you know, th these people didn't worship that way before. I don't think I know Abraham maybe made, you know, sacrifices in an altar, but not with all these instructions and details. I, I, I don't know. It's all very, um, well, unnatural to us, maybe, although maybe, when, huh. you know, that's, when we... That's the key. Yeah. Unnatural to us. Um, yeah. And they didn't know how all the details. That's why God is giving them all the details. Uh, and but very they're... clearly that sacrifices were very much how people worshipped in those days. Um, uh, Yehudi? <laughs> Go ahead. And more to the point, they had to be done precisely correctly in order to have a desired effect. Mm -hmm. In other words, if I go in for surgery and a surgeon leaves behind one sponge, that surgeon is going to end up getting sued. Okay? Because we all sure. know what happens if you leave a sponge behind. And in a surgical procedure, I've assisted enough for them to know. I've done enough for them to know. 
You absolutely have to make sure that every T is crossed and every I is dotted. Uh, and yes, surgery is a big mess. And yes, it's disgusting to look inside people's intestines and see what's in there when you have to do gastrointestinal surgery. You know, yeah, some things that look disgusting are sometimes necessary in order to preserve a life or spiritual health, or religious health, or mental health. And that's exactly what the point of this is. Of course, there's going to be a lot of detail. You make one detail wrong and you mess it up. If people paid as much attention to their, to seeing to it that their prayers, you know, were including detail and put out with the amount of attention that the ancient sacrifices were, they'd be doing a big thing for themselves. Instead, they talk and show, have a good time, smooth, eat everything, but concentrate on the fact that they're actually there to talk and communicate with Hashem. Yeah. Um, and to add to that, which is 100% correct, um, if we think about anything in life that is really important, certainly something like surgery, <laughs> uh, but you know, our anything important in life, we generally have it highly structured. There are specific ways we do things. You know, think of a regular meal. If you were having a dinner party or if you were serving at a wedding, you know, there's a certain order for the courses, not necessarily the same in every culture. But there's a certain order to the culture. There's a certain order to how you set the table and how the utensils are placed out. Um, there, uh, there's all kinds of order and structure in practically everything we do. So that there's so much, I mean, that we find this a little bit revolting. Eh, well, you know, most of us just did not decide to become butchers. You know, if we walked into an abattoir, we probably would not really enjoy it. Exactly. Um, but, you know, for a butcher, you know, it, it, that's what he or she does. And for that matter, for a surgeon, I think uh, Yehudi's example is very good. You know, thank God for surgeons. I can't imagine that when I'm now a year since my surgery, I can't imagine when the cardiologist or the the surgeon went in and opened up my chest and uh, took some stuff from the legs and was sewing things onto my heart. You know, for most of us, I don't think we would have wanted to watch. <laughs> But yeah, you know, you see, that's just it. You know, the priest had to watch, mm -hmm. and basically, if they didn't watch, the main sacrifice would not have been acceptable to Hashem. In right. fact, that issue actually comes up in say from Malachi. The last prophet actually is no longer talking about the acceptability of the people who bring the sacrifice, like the first temple prophets did. Mm -hmm. The last prophet, who we're going to read in a couple of weeks, it's not right. like this a million years from now. The Shabbos before <laughs> Pesach, we're going to read this, okay? And his basic complaint is no longer that the wrong kind of people come to the altar, but they're bringing the wrong kind of animals. Right. In other words, they're putting animals on the altar that don't qualify to be on the altar altogether. So there's no way the sacrifice is going to be accepted. The quality control had, had uh, degraded. Yeah, <laughs> most definitely. So uh, uh, anything I, else? I want to raise a, a quick uh, point yeah. that, that, that stands out to me. The beginning of the parasha, Moses gives all these instructions but it's at his word. It doesn't say God told me to say, which to me is a little bit strange. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole role of Moshe is kind of unusual. We talked about was Moshe a Kohen? Oh, wait a minute. Isn't the uh, commands that Moshe is saying, Zahadavar, Hashem, yeah. weren't, aren't those commands straight me, out of part? Let me just quickly go back. I'm sorry. Here, let me quickly go back. Well, Rabbi Zucha can go back on his own. Rabbi Zucha, go back to chapter 29 of Shemot. And ah. I think you'll see that everything that Moshe is doing in chapter 9 of Ayikra has already been commanded in chapter 29 of Shemot. Okay. He's okay. carrying out what he was but, commanded to do. My, my main point was, and Moses says, and God will appear. 
Okay, that was the said. That wasn't said. Moses is putting that in on his own. But let me just that, that imagine what, what Moses is saying here. He's saying if you do it right, you're going to yeah. see that you did it right. Okay. Um. Just, uh, just uh, you know, people can look at this on their own. Um. And if you really want, there's a whole section in uh, in uh, what's his face in Milgram, uh, talking about the relationship between Exodus 29 and Chapter 8 of Vayikra. Clearly, Chapter 8 of Vayikra is built on Chapter 29. Chapter 29 in Exodus talks about all the things that are going to be done for the ordination of the priests, and here we're actually doing it. So there are a lot of things um, that are not necessarily said in detail here that are said in detail there. Um, you know, even as we come to the dietary laws, there's some things that are detailed in Vayikra that aren't detailed in Devarim. Now, on one hand, as we'll talk about, that's not necessarily the concern of Devarim. However, um, you know, they do probably assume much of Vayikra in Devarim. So coming back, um, Carol, to what, what you were raising and what I mentioned at the beginning is that there is a tremendous difference between, or there can be, a tremendous difference between the language and the thought world, uh, the two are obviously interconnected, uh, of Vayikra, and the contemporary world. It may not be quite as different as we think, but um, this is like emphasized totally in uh, Mary Douglas's book. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, if it's Leviticus as literature. Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I just got, I literally just got it. And I, I, I've only gone through four chapters so far. And um she spends a lot of time talking about the way Leviticus thinks and the language that Leviticus uses. Um, I don't know that she's always right, but, you know, still she points out that we kind of have to enter into the language of the text. Uh, that when we try and impose some of the ways that we think and the way we write, um, well, of course, it's not going to make a whole heck of a lot of sense. Uh, so, you know, in the beginning, when he talks about translation, um, here's what Everett Fox says. This is just, you know, a quick line, but it kind of captures in very short space what we have to remember. Would somebody else like to go on? Just read this. I'll read it. Okay. Like, thank you, Carol. Like, like, yeah, like the other books of the Torah, Leviticus uses its own rhetoric to convey its message. Far from employing flat priestly style, whatever that may be, it uses formulas, refrains, and other rhythmical forms to impress its teachings, Hebrew Torah, upon its hearers. Yeah, so, you know, they're certainly coming from uh, Christian commentators and you know, the, they, they just couldn't deal with Vayikra, for that matter, a lot of Bamidbar. Uh, it was just too dry because it's the notion that, oh, this is religion shorn of all emotional appeal, uh, unlike Christianity. But, you know, once you realize the language and how it's using that language and you kind of enter into its world of thought, suddenly there's a lot more there. Um, you know, this language, uh, Charlotte was telling me, he was commenting on the partiote of the last couple of weeks, and I appreciate the fact that you're reading it carefully, um, that like, you know, they're always talking about the fat. They're always talking about removing, you know, there's, to some extent, reading these partiote is not so terrible because there is, in fact, a lot of repetition. And thank God they mm -hmm. not only repeat the words, but they also repeat the uh, ta'amim, the trope signs. So it makes it a little bit easier. Um, but there is a whole rhythm. There is a whole, if you will, poetry. If not the way we think of poetry, per se, in the writing of Vayikra and in Bamidbar. All you have to do is take a look at Milgram's commentary on Bamidbar in the Jewish Publication Society's uh, commentary. And he points out the structures that are throughout Sefer Bamidbar. And that's what to some extent, 
uh, Douglas does through Vayikra and as well in Bamidbar. Um, and she also points out, and again, for Torah readers, you kind of pick up on this, and if you follow the language carefully, what we talk about as parallelism, um, the fact that Hebrew poetry, classical Hebrew poetry, has a balance generally in uh, rhythm and content. We don't generally use the term parallelism anymore, but when we take a look at the overall phenomenon and how it works in specifically poetic text, we also see that it works within the other texts of the Tanakh, and particularly in the Torah. So just to take a look at, and I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this, Milgram talks about the structure of chapter eight, the chapter we just read, which seems pretty dry. And yes, you do this, 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 this. But let's take a look that if you, one way to look at it, and this is one of two schemes that he presents, that you have at the beginning of the chapter, the assembling of the materials and the persons, you have the command to do it and the fulfillment. Then you have the actual anointing of the priests and all that goes along with that, as well as anointing the sanctuary. Then at the very center, you have the sacrificial service, which is all the different offerings that we read. And then after that, you have the anointing of the priests, the anointing of the priestly, uh, priestly vestments, and then admonitions for the seven days. There are seven days that follow the um, that follow the ordination. We see in the story of Nadav and Avihu, they uh, Aaron and his sons can't go out. They have to remain within the uh, precincts of the Mishkan uh, to eat the sacrifices. Um, they're in a state of purity, uh, and even it's the cousins of Nadav and Avihu will also be Kohanim, but they're the ones who remove the bodies. So Not Kohanim Levi'im. Pardon me? Not Kohanim Levi'im. Kohanim Levi'im, right. So, but, you know, uh, within the priestly type of caste, if you will. Um, so suddenly you take a look and you have like parallel sections, the beginning and the end, hence, you know, A, B and A, B. And in the middle, this is, you know, as we've looked at before many, many times, a chiastic structure, you know, the mirror image of each other. And this is in the dry law of Vayikra. But there's a, there is a poetic structure in there. So, you know, one of the amazing things that um, Douglas has done, but particularly Milgram, Levine, all these people have been writing uh, on um, Vayikra and Bamibar in particular, have been able to demonstrate the poetry of these texts, if not quite, you know, the beautiful uh, sounds of, you know, more classical poetry or images, you know, I mean, as Carol mentioned, uh, we don't necessarily really enjoy reading about, you know, oh, you cut <laughs> open this and you place this on that and you throw the blood. And, you know, it's um, so. But that just, you know, wanted to emphasize that it is a different language and we have to kind of enter into that language to understand it. Now, the other point I, I think that okay, we have go ahead. to keep remembering is that this is part of the ancient uh, ancient world, the ancient Near East, where the other uh, neighboring religions did very similar stuff. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you look at into their material, Babylonian as well as Egyptian, right. uh, it's, it's rather similar. And in fact, in Milgram, he has a whole section in his uh, discussion of the consecration, um, a whole section from, well, first of all, he brings in some descriptions from uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, but um, he also has a whole section from the Semsuluna B inscription. Um uh, it's a Sumerian Ac Acadian inscription. 
He brings in the whole inscription and, and talks about it. So, you know, this still does take place within the context of that world. You know, if someone just, well, um, I'm trying to think of a great example in contemporary times, but I think we understand. It's worthwhile keeping in mind uh, the Rambam's explanation in Mora Nivuchim mm -hmm. about all of this and, and why the temple could be destroyed later. And, and it's not God's punishment, but we graduated in our understanding of what Hashem wants. But initially, we weren't much different from uh, our neighbors. Yeah, the great insight. Um, you know, of course, there are some uh, cynical jokes at the seminary. If the Romans hadn't destroyed the temple, we would have had to find a way to get rid of it ourselves. But, um, you know, which is... That's, that's, that's cynical. I think that's a perfectly reasonable statement. Yeah. <laughs> the point is... Yeah, it is. <laughs> that's a, in other words, what, why, were us, why are we so tied to the second temple? Why do we feel... And mourn it so much because it was torn away from us at a time that we still liked it. And it was the centerpiece of our entire enterprise at the mm -hmm. time it was torn away from us. Had, had time gone on, let's say by the time 500 more years after that, animal sacrifice was pretty well given up by everybody in the mm -hmm. ancient Near Eastern and Hellenistic mm. world. And there's no question that Judaism would have found a way to come up, but once somebody tears something away from you, then you become doubly attached to it. And, you know, it's always going to be something you're going to long for. When we long for sacrifices, what we're really long for is the kind of religious feeling that mm -hmm. came with them. You know, that, let's face it, we don't get from praying at the synagogue. You know, I mean, we're so used to synagogues. I remember when I last time I was in Jerusalem, I, I went for Chagas Sukkot. So I was expecting a supreme spiritual experience and made it my business to be on at the Kotel for the first day of Chagas Sukkot. You know, something, but you keep in mind, the Americans who were there had to observe the second day and Simchus Torah <laughs> and the day after Shmini Azar. So given that, that meant that we were all dominating in what was called the Beit Knesset Haggadot. So after one day at the Kota, I said to myself, you know something, I'm not at all unhappy with the fact that tomorrow and for the rest of the Moed, I'm going to be dominating the Beit Knesset Haggadot. Why? Because even the Kota, which is the closest thing that you could possibly get to, to the sense of being there, so to speak, it's it just doesn't fit anymore the way we basically got our heads organized. You know, our, our heads are organized around shuls, not around altars. Our heads are organized around prayer, not around sacrifices. You know, we can still long nostalgically for them, but what we're really longing for is the kind of feeling our ancestors had when they brought them. Chana is a perfect example. Yeah. Um, of course, even one of my colleagues said, um, he is kind of cynical, so I, I get, but, you know, he said, um, in the Kotel for him, it's you know, it's another Herodian ruin. Because, you know, we also well, have to remember Herodian ruin. Pardon me? It's a question of what emotional freight you would right. have to it. Look, let's think about it. How do the Muslims look upon our Kotel? You know, I mean, let's simple, simple example. If let's say women at the wall start making the fuss about the fact that women aren't worshiping at the Kotel, at the place they would like to worship, it's blown up, it's in our, it's a whole new place. If let's say the local Muslims start a kind of, kind of a problem, Muslims living in Jerusalem, about where you're worshiping at the Kotel, and they start throwing rocks, then you know something? Then the Kotel's cleared out real fast, and nobody sits there and worries about who's happening where. You know, in other words, you know, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, how where it's coming from makes a big difference in how people look at it, you know, because, and again, they don't really feel it's anything but a commitment to something that happened in the past. Mm -hmm. If the Muslims started saying we're going to close down the shul, yeah, like I said, I've seen plenty of people who want to give the Western Wall back because that's occupied territory. Yeah. Well, we're never giving back our shoes, so though, are we? Yeah. So let's go on now. Yeah. yeah, let's go on um, and take a look. Coda, 
the, the Beit HaMikdash also symbolizes independence. Yes. Of course. Yeah. But you do have to realize, Rabbi Zucker, that for 500 years, that was not the actual case. During the entire period of the Second Temple, the only time we did have independence was maybe from 142 to, to BCE to 63, less than a century. No, but so the, re the rebuilt, the, re the rebuilt, the, the, the Beit HaMikdash HaShlishi is, is a symbol of independence. Yeah. But, but the, 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 the whole Beit HaMikdash, that's there. another story. Let's go back to our parasha. And um, take a look at just a little bit about the dietary laws. So first of all, let's take a look at both the beginning and end of the commands for the dietary laws. Uh, Carol, you were reading, I think. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, these are the living creatures that you may eat from all the domestic animals that are upon the earth. OK, that's the beginning. Um, and then the concluding statement in uh, the laws. This is the instruction regarding animals, birds and all living beings that stir in the water, all beings that swarm upon the earth, that there may be separation between the tame and the pure, between the living creatures that may be eaten and the living creatures that you are not to eat. Okay, so that's how Vayikra frames the dietary laws. Anything that strikes you about this language? Think of other parts of the Torah. Another hint. Where else in the Torah do we talk about animals? Different animals. Uh, in, uh, oh, yeah. The ark. The uh, ark. The ark and? Genesis. Before that? When they were first created? Yeah. Creation. This is very similar to the language of creation. Um, You know, uh, the whole nefesh hashoretzet al haaretz. And Torah habema va'of the whole nefesh hachaya haromeset b'mayim. You know there is a there is a similarity in language between this and creation, and most definitely also with Noah. So we'll come back to um, that in a second. Uh, now here again, I should say um, the vocabulary the, stays the same. Pardon me. The p vocabulary stays the same. Yes. Um, that's an important point. The so-called P or priestly editors of the uh, Torah um, were seen as those who produced much of or edited um, the stories of at least one of the, the first story of creation and uh, different parts of the Noah tale. And very clearly they were involved in this. And now let's take a look at the end of the, uh, sorry, that, that, that was the, beginning um let's take a, a look at uh the middle part well well actually the end of the um the very end of the section of the vaikra i apologize I, I somehow messed up all the copying okay go on carol for i hashem am your god you shall sanctify yourselves and be holy for i am holy you shall not make yourselves impure through any swarming thing that moves upon the earth. For I Hashem, am the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Going on. These are the instructions concerning animals, birds, all living creatures that move in water, and all creatures that swarm on earth. For distinguishing between the impure and the pure, between the living things that may be eaten and the living things that may not be eaten. Okay, so again, we have that language reflecting creation and Noah. And also we have this other identification here, this other importance. Why are we doing all of this? In Motatsia Dei. So I said. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. To be holy, because God's holy. God right. said to do it. Right, to God to do it. But it's 
for us to be holy when people say, oh, we don't have a, we don't know why we're supposed to keep kosher. Well, here we are, <laughs> because it's, it's a way of distinguishing and making us holy. Uh, and um, by the way, it says down here, at the, the concluding line, lahabdil beina tameu veina tahor. Um, for distinguish these are instructions for distinguishing between the impure and the pure, between the living things that may be eaten and the living things that may not be eaten. This whole neck notion of Havdalah, which again goes back to creation, God, you know, divides up the different yeah. parts, he organizes everything. Um, but also, this makes sense in that Am Yisrael is supposed to be Mamlechet Kohanim, the Goy Kadosh a kingdom of priests and a holy people. And part of the role of the priests that we see elsewhere in this parashan elsewhere is lahavdil beina tahor. So to some extent, the holiness of the Kohanim, you know, also is part of Israel. There's an, there is, this is how we acquire holiness. And now I just want to go back to a, um, a comment that Milgram makes uh, about, understanding some of these connections. And, and, and it should also be said that much of what Douglas tries to do in talking about the language of Vaikra is to talk about how it uses <laughs> analogies, uh, that it compares or, or connects things. It's using what she calls a mythopoetic way of thinking. But um, here's how Milgram describes it. Uh, can you see it, Carol? Yes. This point is a major concern of Mary Douglas, Leviticus. Oh, no, no, that was that was an earlier one. Uh, okay. Number two. Milgram. Far more useful, however, is Douglas's utilization of the Durkheimian hypothesis that the classification of animals reflects society's values. Just a quick background. Um, he is basing himself not on her, her later book, but on an earlier book, Purity and Danger, and her initial work on trying to understand the dietary laws. Um, Mary Douglas is an anthropologist, not a biblicist. And she made a number of errors that were brought out by Milgram and other scholars. Um, and one of the things she tried to do was try and understand why these classes of animals, why are they forbidden? Why are these forbidden and these permitted? And she tried to connect it to... Uh, their modes of locomotion, um, how they moved. And that generally has been rejected. But he's saying that she was using another anthropological idea uh, developed by Emil Durkheim, father of modern anthropology and sociology, who, by the way, wrote on dietary laws and was the son of a rabbi. So, you know, I, I think that Judaism... I haven't read any biographies of Durkheim, but I really uh, I remember in a class I had with Elliot Dorf, he was quoting some stuff from Durkheim, and I said, this guy sounds Jer Jewish, and sure enough, <laughs> uh, he was, and I think was initially studying to be a rabbi. Anyway, so the whole idea is that the animals can be classified in such a way that it reflects society's values. Go on. The correspondences? The correspondences between the human and animal worlds come into clearer view once it is noticed that each comprises three identical divisions that can be depicted as concentric circles. In the priestly view, P and H. Yeah, the they, uh, there's a notion that there are different uh, within the so-called P document or P traditions, um, there are earlier and later strata, and they make a distinction between P and the later strata of the holiness code, but H, not that important at the moment. The tripartite anyway. division of the human race corresponds to three of the covenants with God, mankind, Genesis 9, 1 through 11, including the animals. That was after Noah. Israel, that is the patriarchs. Um, and the priesthood. The three human divisions are matched by the three animal division. All animals are permitted to mankind except their blood, the edible few to Israel, 
and of the edible, the domesticated and unblemished qualify as sacrifices to the Lord. Yeah. So, you know, in talking about, and again, try, you know, in understanding these texts, it's like, aha, uh, you know, we have these distinctions, but they are part of an overall distinction, an overall sense of the values. We'll come to the three circles in a moment. Um, well, actually, let's just ju jump to the three circles. So mm -hmm. in concentric circles, you have a larger category, in this case, mankind, and then a more limited category, which is Israel. We are an Am Segula, a special people to God. And then within Israel, there is the special category of the Kohanim, who are, if you will, more holy uh, to some extent. And uh, so their gradations of holiness uh, as one moves inside relating to persons. And that similar type of gradation of holiness also connects with um, how it views, you know, the animal kingdom in that all animals, they're all permitted to all people, but Israel can only eat certain animals and the animals that are offered to Hashem, those are even more limited. So I have gradations of holiness and concentric circles, if you will, of holiness. Um, so uh, actually, let's go back now to contrast the way Vayikra is thinking about the dietary laws and how Devarim, because this is the dietary laws also appear in chapter 14 of Devarim. So would somebody else like to read? This is the verses. This is how it's introduced in Sefer Devarim. Any volunteers to read? Okay, Carol, you can continue. Children are you to Hashem your God. You are not to gash yourselves. You are not to put a bald spot between your eyes for a dead person. For you are a people holy to Hashem your God. It is you whom Hashem has chosen to be for him, especially treasured people from all the peoples that are in the face of the ground. You are not to eat any ab any abominable thing. These are the animals that you may eat. So what? Um, how are the dietary laws introduced? What? What is the purpose of these laws? To set us aside as a special people to God. Right. Yeah, like uh, we saw in Vaikra, the notion of being an Am Kadosh, or as they say here, uh, oh. Adonai liot lo am segula. And for you, Adonai has chosen to be to him a treasured people from all the peoples. So, you know, it's again this notion of holiness and holiness through what we eat or don't eat. Um, We've talked about this before and probably talk about it again just very quickly. Um, let's not forget that almost every single culture has its dietary rules or customs, things that surround meals, things that, you know, what things are eaten, you know, like what things are eaten could very much be decided by, you know, what is local. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea of dietary laws, the centrality of food to just about every culture we can't ignore so that they would choose food as one way to express holiness is not all that unusual. Um, and if you don't believe that food is so crucial, well, then take a look at any newspaper. Um, almost every single newspaper has a food section. And look how much, I mean, who thinks, who would ever imagine that you could have an entire channel on television, I mean, especially those of us who grew up with three channels, who could ever imagine that you would have an entire food network <laughs> and 24 hours a day? They could talk about food. So, Okay, and here is the end of the uh, section from Deuteronomy. Go on, Carol. You are not to eat any carcass. To the sojourner that is within your gates, you may give it, that he may eat it or it may be sold to a foreigner. For you are a people holy to Hashem your God. You are not to boil a kid in the milk of its mother. 
Yeah, this is the one place that, of course, that very famous line appears three times in the Torah. Um, and this is the only place where it appears in connection with dietary laws. Although, you know, it seems to be Rambam, as we've talked about this, that Rambam suspected that it was um, uh, in specifically against a pagan practice, though we found no such pagan practice. But um, within the first context, especially in uh, Shemot, it's in rules of sacrifice. And here, too, uh, this whole section is introduced by things that we don't do because the other peoples do them. Gashings oneself, making a bald spot. These are pagan practices that we are not to do. So, again, not just a dietary the, the, the law, but it may be against some pagan practice. So again, like Vayikra, we have the emphasis, of course, on holiness. But what seems to be missing here? That we had in Vayikra. How does it talk? Does it talk about the animals? Not the specific animals. Yeah, no. I mean, it does go in to talk about what animals are forbidden and which are uh, what which are prohibited, which are permitted. But it doesn't go into the same type of language. This is clearly the Book of Deuteronomy, which has its own unique style, and it's not um, like P. And it's not necessarily trying to make the same connections between all of creation. Um, you know, the, the going back to um, or. Uh, the covenants between, you know, you, we saw before that uh, Douglas makes a connection between the different covenants between God and human beings, God and Israel, God and the Kohanim. You know, that's not necessarily the concern of Devarim. Um, also, they use a slightly different term here. They use toeva rather than sheketz, similar type of thing. Um, but you know, more of a discussion there. So um, Deuteronomy is much more earthly centered than godly centered. I mean, certainly godly centered, you know, it's it's a very strict monotheism and a very strict um, ethnic characteristic, uh, much more so than Vaikra. But just a couple of other things, just a couple of commentaries to once again, connect to the um the dietary laws um anyone else want to read or carol do you want to continue uh, there's nobody else there okay yeah. for, for i hashem am the one who brought you up this is a commentary on, by rashi obviously on condition that you should accept my commandments did i bring you up yeah very important you know we're coming to pesach and right after pesach we have Shavuot. That's not by accident. You know, we came out of Israel um, because we are going to enter into a new covenant with God. You know, it's, uh, I always love the line in um, uh, America the Beautiful. Uh, I think it was the third third verse. Um, uh, the, 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 the thy liberty in law you know that's how judaism looks at it you know we we attain our freedom by accepting certain responsibilities okay go on another explanation of for i hashem am the one who brought you up in all of the places it is written i brought you out and here it is written who brought you up in reference to this, it was taught in the school of Rabbi Ishmael. If I had brought up Israel from Egypt only to effect this one thing, that they do not defile themselves by reptiles, as do the other peoples, that should be sufficient for them. Baba Metzia. Well, and, it should be and it should be regarded by them as an elevation for themselves. This is implied in the expression used here brought up okay so you know obviously this was uh rashi is quoting uh as rashi frequently does uh, a rabbinic comment 
And, you know, clearly uh, in the school of Rabbi Ishmael, they just want to emphasize you know, how important it is that we don't eat reptiles. <laughs> um, but he's actually pointing to something that's really interesting in that um, we have here uh, in the beginning of Vayikra, uh, if we go back, back up here in Vayikra, you know, um, For I am I I Hashem am your God. You shall make it. For I Hashem am the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Hamaale etchem me eretz mitzrayim in the Hebrew. Hamaale etchem instead of the more common vohotzi vohotzi etchem, which you know we'll have all over the place in uh, Pesach. Um, Douglas makes a very interesting comment that they use the term maale here. That's also the term that's used, and I think she's really pushing it here, but it is a little interesting, and Rashi clearly picks up something unique, that ma'ale is the same term used for the animals that chew their cud, hmm. that bring up their cud to chew it. Right. And she thinks that, uh, she suggests that this may be uh, the specific use of ma'ale is to connect them that you know we observe these mitzvot uh as remembrance of what god has done for us there's a connection between you know again in the um analog uh, analogical thinking that uh do you elaborate on what you mean by the animal i'm not lost you somewhere what do you yeah. mean say the animals that choose their cut are characterized by the word ma'ale I, I didn't get that well because when it talks about them chewing their cut is hama'ale um Mala Gera. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it's clever. I don't I'm not so clever sure I think is, it is uh, Pratis not. Yeah. Um I, I love Douglas's work. I think it's just fascinating. Um at the end of the day, she's still an anthropologist, <laughs> not a biblicist. And I think she makes a few, you know, she's got her idea, and everything has to fit that idea. It's kind of like um, I, I don't want to make fun of it because I think they did they did some wonderful stuff. Um, uh, Jewish Lights Publishing, they they published some great stuff, but they also have a tendency because the the phrase tikkun olam became well as they rose to prominence that became like the word the phrase to describe everything in Judaism. So so many of their books they have a tendency to say oh everything is tikkun olam. You know, uh, tikkun olam is beautiful and it is a central idea in Judaism. <laughs> it's not the only idea in Judaism and it doesn't totally define Judaism. And now one other famous, um, sorry, I just want to finish, a famous commentary of Ramban here, the purport of, and then here he's commenting on Devarim, another the comment on the dietary laws. The purport of, for you are a people holy to Hashem your God, is connected with, you are not to boil a kid in the milk of its mother. Although it is not an abhorrent food, he prohibited it because we are to be holy in choice of foods or become, or because we ourselves are holy, that we may not become a cruel people that is not compassionate by milking the mother and extracting its milk to boil, them, to boil therein its kid. And although any meat cooked in milk is included in this prohibition, because any nursing animal is called mother and any suckling offspring is called kid, and if they are together in the process of cooking, there is an element of cruelty in all such cases. So, um, of course, this is Ramban's uh, way of trying to find uh, a moral significance behind the laws of Kashrut. And to some extent, that's the same. Uh, that's also part. I haven't finished Douglas's book, but um, that's also what she tries to do. What she tried to do originally in trying to explain why these animals are proven, these are uh, permitted. Um, she also tried, as Milgram said, uh, let's go up to uh, Milgram here. Um, the correspondences between the human and animal worlds, uh, sorry, the, uh, 
that the classification of animals reflects society's values. And I think that it, it is very clear that kashrut represents a number of values. Uh, and there are values behind kashrut. It's just not an arbitrary type of thing. So, Rabbi Papi, would you yeah. go so far as to say, well, let's say all the strife that goes on between Hindus and Muslims in India over whether to forbid beef or to forbid uh, pig, is that a reflection of some inherent value or just the way people were brought up? Yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's hard to know. Yeah, I think no. it's hard to know here too because look, look at the bit with the pig bones in there. It's Australia. That goes back to seems before the Torah was read. <laughs> so as a practical matter, it seems that from day one, we didn't seem to have any use for pigs. Uh, and the question is, on uh, what? why did we have no use for them? I have my own theories. I'll write you an email about it. Yeah, I have to say that there, I mean, just in terms of kashrut, I would say that there are um, a lot of different, I mean, I, kashrut develops. You know, it uh, comes from earlier practices and, you know, and, you know pre-Israelite stuff. Um, we see the development within Israelite tradition moving from um, Vayikra, which doesn't really permit secular slaughter, and then that's permitted in Devarim. So very clearly, it's hard to find just one overarching, I mean, I don't believe there's one overarching rule for Kashrut. Um, I think it's something that developed over time, but I think at various times they did try. Hello, they did try Sorry. and inject um, values within the whole system, and uh, so, for example, there is a uh, a book by it was done for U.S. Wires, uh, done by United Synagogue, Sanctify Life on Kashrut, and the point is that much of kashrut really does seem to be uh, based on the notion of sanctifying life, which is a value that runs throughout the Tanakh. So um, I just really want this week wanted to point out that first of all, in approaching the language of Vayikra, we've got to reorient our thinking and recognize that there's much more going on in the text than, than we might be used to, we might be able to identify uh, just in a first reading. I mean, it really takes a lot of thought. And then, uh, you know, to think a little bit about what's involved with kashrut. Um, you know, so what are some of the ways that we think about it? Um, you know, the, the sanctity of anim animal life is important in the Torah. And uh, so, you know, the idea of uh, kashrut, you know, it connects to creation. God creates all life. You know, and then God makes a covenant with Noah and with all the animals. God's not going to destroy the world again. So that uh, there are values that uh, are uh, spread throughout our practices. Maybe not each and every individual practice. You know, I wouldn't make that statement. But it's important to realize that probably even already in the earliest statement of our dietary laws, there are very clearly values that are being reflected or that we have to examine things much more carefully and understand within the uh, the concept of the thinking of Vaikra. Well, have you considered uh, Yonatan Adler's book on the formation of Judaism and his uh, his material about Kashrut observance? No. No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't. Look, read that. look, look at that, because he seems to suggest that it's it doesn't really start uh, to later. And I remember Milgram suggesting that uh, Kashrut was not widely observed really till uh, after uh, by a Cheney. Hmm. I mean, we have the laws, and, there, and some may be very early, but universal practice probably was much later. Well, I think that um, the rabbis expand considerably yeah, absolutely. And, on, on, on the biblical laws so that, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and of course, the Judaism that we live or that we think of is rabbinic Judaism. And uh, that's later than the Bible. Not that things weren't already practiced, but, you know, like you said, maybe not in the same way they would be later or understood later. A lot of the rules are... 
for the Kohanim and and they were the ones practicing mm -hmm. Ashrut much more than than Amcha. But it's interesting how the language of the Torah begins to expand that into the people and not just the Kohanim, for as much as it separates the Kohanim. And then, of course, in Devarim, they'll get confused between Kohanim Levi'im. <laughs> yeah, Levitical priests, as they translate it. So thank you all. Yes, Have a good you. Shabbat. And just, you know, read carefully as we're following along in uh, our readings of Vaikra. Okay. Rabbi Zucker, great to see you. Same here. Take care. Give my best uh, to Elena. Thank you. Likewise. Mm -hmm. All the family.